Hi, it's David Avern with the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast. So what's your story? Everyone has them and smart companies know how to tell theirs. Well, too many sales approaches focus on features and benefits. My guest today is John Livesey, aka the Pitch Whisperer. And John helps organizations and salespeople perfect their stories to connect with prospects and build lasting relationships. Stay tuned for a great conversation with John Livesey. It's David Averin on the Customer Experience Advantage podcast back in 20 seconds. You're listening to the Customer Experience Advantage podcast with David Averin, featuring candid conversations with some of the most influential leaders in business today. Sit back and listen in or feel free to watch the video version online. This is the Customer Experience Advantage podcast, and here's David Averin. Hey, folks. Thanks and welcome to the Customer Experience Advantage podcast. We talk customer experience, but we talk business because I guess we experience everything as part of the transaction and the relationship and the interaction. And of course, how we interact has changed dramatically. And, you know, in, in so many ways, we lost connection during COVID, or we found different ways to connect, right? As, as John and I, and I'll do formal introduction here in a second, as we look at each other face to face and remind those who are listening on all of the audio platforms for this podcast, we do have the video version as well. And you can see how attractive we both are uh, <laughs> on my website at davidaverin.com slash podcast or podcasts, I can't remember, but look at the site. And it's also on, on YouTube as well. But we found great ways to, to connect and others are still being dragged, kicking and screaming into, into the new era. But I think it has made, uh, in the time when we didn't have the opportunity to connect in person or touch or feel or, or look at, at products at trade shows or things like that, how we talk about things, how we make a connection has even been brought to the forefront as even more important. Um, today, we're going to talk about storytelling, um, not in terms of, of young children and holding a book in the front of the room but the real conversations that we have with real people. And I'm all in on this. And so, and John's one of the best. He's the author of the, of the new book, The Sale is in the Tale. I'll tell you a bit more about him. He's known as the Pitch Whisperer, sales keynote speaker who shows companies, sales teams, how to turn mundane case studies into compelling case stories so they win more new business. From John's award-winning career at Condé Nast, he shares the lessons he learned that turns sales teams into revenue rock stars. His TEDx talk is called Be the Lifeguard of Your Own Life, has over a million views. And his brand new book, The Sale is in the Tale, is a business fable um, that uh, about sales representatives whose old ways of selling are not working anymore. And the reader accompanies the rep on his journey and learns how to use storytelling to strengthen their soft skills and improve their professional relationships. John, thanks and welcome to the show. David, thanks for that warm introduction. You know what? It was incredibly well crafted, most of it by you. But <laughs> but isn't that the point? Isn't that the point that that the things we are we're doing aren't ad hoc? It doesn't mean that they're scripted or overly rehearsed. But but we put some thought into how we're going to communicate uh, who we are, what we do, and why that's important. Tell me a little bit about the the genesis for for your mission to help promote storytelling. Well. When you just said that, it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes, which is by Arthur Ashe, the famous tennis pro, yeah. who said the key to success is confidence and the key to confidence is preparation. And I think the more prepared we are, the better we perform. And we see actors do it before they get on set at a movie. Athletes do it. They don't wait for the crowd to show up. And so many people say, I'm just going to wing it. I'll figure it out when I get in front of someone. And I thought, why do you do that? Nobody else who's a professional does that. Sure. My own story was selling advertising, as you mentioned, for Condé Nast. And I would call on clients like Lexus and their ad agency would say, you know, we looked at uh, 25 magazines. We've narrowed it down to 10 that get to come in for 30 minutes each and pitch back to back to back. And we're going to pick three and do not come in and talk about numbers. We've already analyzed that. And that's why you're in the finals. And I went, Oh, whoever tells the best story is the one that's going to get this ad campaign. Sure. Uh, the marketing idea, whatever it is. And half the reps were deer in headlights, David. They were like, I can't talk about circulation or the income of my readers. I don't know what I'm going to say. So that really um, allowed me with my advertising background to go, oh, I know what a story is. I used to work for an agency where we would take movies and edit them down to come out on home video back in the day of Blockbuster. 
And that's really where I honed my storytelling skills was realizing if a movie hadn't done well theatrically, you could edit it a different way and make people want to go rent or even buy it. Talk to us about the difference between the wrong story and the right story, a bad story <laughs> and a good story, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what that means. And, and people who dismiss it as soft and it's manipulative. Hmm. And um, there's a difference between a story that's that's lightly relevant and one that really makes a connection. And it's not about, about I'm going to let you explain it because because I'm a, I'm I'm all in on this. But but okay. talk to us about the misunderstandings of what yes. you mean, and when you confront it, when you talk to clients and prospects as well. How do we do it wrong, and how do we do it right? Well, if we zoom out, we first have to become aware that people make decisions about who they're going to hire, what they're going to buy, emotionally and not logically. That for half of the people out there is a big aha moment. They're like, what? I just showed the numbers. This makes this product go 30% faster. Why don't, it's so logical. Why aren't you buying it? And I explain that we buy emotionally, the right side of our brain, where storytelling and imagination and empathy and listening live. So literally, it's the soft skills that make us strong, not the opposite. And what makes a good story is three things. It's clear, concise, and compelling. So why does it have to be clear? Because if we confuse somebody, the confused mind says no, and they don't tell you they're confused. Why does it have to be concise? This is really one of the key secrets, David. For the meeting after the meeting, because they're going to hear three different people pitch, and then they have right. a meeting after that, and they go, well, what'd you think? They all sound the same. I guess we should go for this less expensive. But if you've told a story that's concise enough for them to remember and repeat it, you're going to be the one they remember. And then compelling... That's the emotional part. When we tug at heartstrings, people open purse strings. So when you have your story as that checklist, clear, concise, compelling, you know you're on the right path to telling a good story. Right. And, but compelling also has another part of it. And I think it does fit within that last one, which is relevance. Mm -hmm. It's connected. It's compelling because it means something to them. Yes. Because it's about them. They can see the connection. If it's so far afield that they, they have a hard time making that connection between that, okay, that was a great story, but I need to increase my sales. Yes. How do we, how do we take those stories and make them connected and relevant so that they recognize how it affects them? Well, the first awareness is the same story is not going to work for everybody. Just like the same pitch doesn't work for it. You need to customize it. So I tell people, think of your brain like a playlist or a jukebox Instead of different songs coming out, different stories come out because the ultimate goal is that you tell a story that somebody sees themselves in and then they want to go on the journey with you. 100%. Want a quick, want a quick example? Yeah, please. I was working with a tech healthcare company and they had a product that made surgeries go 30% faster and they were confused why they weren't selling more. And so we turned that statistic into this story. Imagine how happy Dr. Higgins was down at Long Beach Memorial when he could go out to the patient's family an hour earlier than expected using this equipment. And if you've ever waited for someone you love to come out of surgery, you know every minute feels like an hour. And he came out, put them out of their waiting misery and said, good news, the scope shows they're going to be fine. Turned to the rep and said, you know, that's why I became a doctor for moments like this. Now that rep tells that case story to another doctor at another Ooh. hospital who says, you know what? That's why I became a doctor. I want your equipment too. The client said, oh my gosh, that gives us chills. Not only are we not telling a story, it never occurred to us to make the patient's family a character in the story. Absolutely. And so there's all of the elements we just talked about. It's clear, it's concise, the people see themselves in the story, it's memorable, uh, it's hugs at the heartstrings, and all of that shifts from 30% faster to a case story that makes a huge impact. Right, and, and I'm all in on this. Like I, I said, I, I tell a lot of stories on stage when I speak as well. Mm -hmm. And what I learned early on is, is characters have, have um, or stories have, have characters, they have dialogue, they yes. have emotion, and they have heroes, and the hero is never you. Exactly. Right, it's never you, right? And so even that story as you tell it, and I think about it in terms of, um, in talking to, to that other doctor and saying, and you know, they're in there and they're agonizing and they're running through every scenario in their mind, what could be going wrong. Yep. And every minute that goes by deepens their angst and their anxiety. And right. 
and then you give them that wonderful relief. And then you walk in an hour early and you're able to, to root and you yes. see that reaction and knowing what, I love it. I mean, a lot of people, when, and there's others who talk about stories and, and, and your book as well, the brand new book out, The Sale is in the Tale. See how I gave you a nice plug of that. Um, but it helps them understand that it's not about telling an irrelevant story or just being, it's telling stories that have to do with what they're doing or illustrate. It. It's one of the things that I did when I worked for a long time with them. Um, with a CEO roundtable group, I was a chair with Vistage International, yeah. and I would talk to prospects and I would say, uh, tell a story about a, a CEO who was, uh, said when he really felt it and he got the pressure and the reality of where he was, he says it was the company picnic. And I was like, mm. say more. He says, every day I see my employees and I see the work that we do and we're all up at two o'clock in the morning and we're all stressing. He says, for the first time ever, I saw their families mm. and I saw their children. And I didn't sleep that night. And the pressure was crushing hmm. when realizing that everything that I do affects them and these children and their families and their aspirations. And that was crushing, right? And then it brought a connection to the person I'm talking to. And they're like, welcome to my world. Hmm. Now they know through that tale, through that story that I understand their circumstance. I brought their pain to the surface. And of course, now we offer the solution to that pain. So um, I, I'm all in on that. How do you teach others, sales professionals, organizations that you work with mm -hmm. and speak for, how to identify the right stories and how to, to tell them in compelling ways? Well, the good news is you don't have to be this gifted storyteller from birth. <clears throat> it's not like you have this uh, born talent to be an opera singer or an athlete. Um, anyone can learn to become a storyteller and even elevating it up to where people can see themselves in the story with a structure. But once you understand that um, a story has a structure, so it's the first part is the exposition. You must paint the picture. Who, what, where, when. Let us know where we are. And then the second part is the problem. And as you were alluding to, the better we describe the problem, the more people think we have their solution. And then you talk about, as you said, the relief, what the solution is. And the real secret, David, is the resolution. What is life like after that has happened? Imagine right. if the Wizard of Oz ended when Dorothy got in the balloon to go back to Kansas. But no, there's that wonderful resolution scene where she realizes there's no place like home and yep. all you, you know. So that's what the story needs. So if we go back to the story I told earlier, we know the name of the doctor, we know how long ago, we know what hospital, and we're in the story. Then we know the problem is the patient's family's waiting and all that pain. And I pull you in by saying, if you've ever had to wait, you know how every minute feels like an hour. The solution is the doctor coming out and saying, good news, an hour earlier, the patient's going to be fine. But the real resolution that makes that story so compelling is the doctor's dialogue to the rep, as you mentioned. Right. We don't know, you know, this is why I became a doctor. So that is that story broken down into those four steps that people go, oh, it was all there. It was fairly transparent, hopefully, without a lot of structure being obvious. But once you understand the structure, it allows you to duplicate that. Yeah. And I, and I found a lot of times the best stories, it's not you telling what happened. It's you telling it as it's happening. Exactly. Present right? tense. So it's not saying, so once a doctor went into a waiting room and here's what right. he said to them, it's like, right. he walks in, he says, great news. Right. And you're doing it with yes. the kind of emotion and just talking like people talk. The, the, the way I like to equate it is, is for those who feel like they might be nervous doing something like this is imagine the conversation at Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Right. It's authentic. We're reminiscing about stuff. We're laughing about stuff and saying, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. But this. Oh, God, this one's right. And we're, we're animated with our hands and we're telling it like it's a story. Yes. As opposed to a scripted story. This is one of the things that makes me crazy. And I, and I, I apologize to my wonderful colleagues. But there's speech coaches and others out there who talk about being very deliberate. Don't wander around the stage. Pick a point. Move purposely to the point. And this is where you make the hand gesture. And I'm uh, like, kill me. How yeah. about you just be real? Right. Just teach what you know. And this one time, let me tell you about a thing. So my daughter, <laughs> like five years old, she's like, dad, uh, uh, right? As opposed to my daughter was very precocious. And she had a way of talk, just talk like it. Right. And those kinds of things make you real and accessible, but they also feel like you really get it, don't you? Yes. If you can make people feel like they're eavesdropping in on the conversation by having the dialogue in present tense, then 
it's fantastic. And the beauty of a story is it allows you to show what your point is as opposed to telling it. Um, you want another example? Please. I was working with an architecture firm. They were up for renovating an airport. The stakes were pretty high. Whoever won it was going to get a <clears> billion <throat> dollars because that's what it costs to renovate yep. an airport over five years. And they had some wonderful before and after pictures of other work they'd done, but no story to go with the pictures. So we crafted this story. Imagine six years ago at JFK, we were working with JetBlue in their terminal. And during that project, we had to rip off all the tiles in the middle of the night from nine at night till nine in the morning and rewire everything so that the stores could open on time without losing money. And we had all the vendors on call in case something went wrong. And sure enough, at two in the morning, a fuse blew. We had somebody there in 20 minutes. They fixed it. And in 8.59, the last tile went down. All the stores opened on time. And now a year after the complete renovation, sales are up 15% in those stores because we've designed a place that pulls more people in and keeps them shopping longer. Oh, the old way of doing that, David would have been to say, we use critical thinking to anticipate problems. But instead we showed it by saying we had all the vendors on call because we anticipate every potential problem. And if we need right. them, we fix it. And, and part of that is, drama. yeah. Right, and part of it is acknowledging, listen, there's a lot of people who can do this. A lot of talented people. I'm a big believer in, in never criticizing or belittling competitors. Compliment them. See, they're all real good, but here's what we do differently. Here's yeah. what we understand that they don't. And being able to illustrate it that way. What do you think about those who, um, and Simon Sinek and Brilliant and others talk about this, about knowing your why and being really yes. clear on your why. Um, I struggle that with a bit because I think it, I don't know that customers really care about your why, but they really care about their why. Yes. Knowing that you understand their why. Uh -huh. um, how, give me examples of, of companies, sales professionals and others who think they understand this. What do, what's some of the common mistakes and misunderstandings about story that derail a, a successful pitch? I think the biggest mistake people make in telling a story is not having a structure to it. So it rambles and just goes on and on and on. And people no. are bored or they're not paying attention anymore. And they certainly can't remember it or repeat it. And then you've just told a story. And if you make, again, the other big mistake, as you said, is making yourself the hero instead of the client. Um, if you have any role in the story, it's as the Sherpa you know, helping them climb Mount well, Everest or Yoda yeah. in Star Wars, right? That they, in order for them to see themselves in the story, you have to have a story that is just like them, whatever the role is, whatever the situation is. And most people don't know how to do that. And so they just tell a story about themselves and, um, and people go, well, good for you. Because here's the unspoken question everybody has when they hear you pitch or tell a story. Will this work for me? And if you haven't told a story where they see themselves in it, they might trust and like you, but they still aren't going to buy until you've told a story that they see themselves in. So the airport that was listening to that story about the renovation in JetBlue, they said, oh, they, they know what they're doing. But more importantly, they're measuring sales being up after. The, so we're spending all this money and we're going to get some of it back by sales increasing at the retail stores, which we really hadn't thought about as a potential source of revenue. And so that made them go, that's what, those are the kinds of outcomes we want. And then that makes it much more compelling that they go, that's who we want to work with. What are the shortcuts that you see people? Cause I'll tell you from my perspective, um, there's some really lazy shortcuts, which mm -hmm. are telling some well-known tried and true standard stories and trying to sound knowledgeable, whether they're telling the story of, of uh, FedEx and how they got an F on their paper in college, or God forbid, uh, they're telling the starfish story, which makes all of us slash our wrists under the table. Uh, well, I made a difference to that one. Um, there's a difference between telling other people's stories and telling your stories. Talk about that for a second. Sure. I think we have pretty much uh, know now that nobody needs to hear another story about Steve Jobs. And how <laughs> yeah, I think agreed, we're, right? I think, I think we're done with that. Um, and unless you have somehow interacted with Elon Musk, I don't think that's even really relevant either. Or, or that so, you have the right to tell it. Yeah, 
I mean, um, that's, that's the Hallmark card version, okay? Or something somebody else wrote and you're just recounting it for them. Um, it might ha- make a point, but it doesn't really make a connection, does it? Exactly. And that's what we want. We want that emotional connection because in order to get people to change their behavior, they have to be moved. You have to break through the clutter with a story that's grabbing their attention and has some unexpected twists because if a story doesn't have conflict in it, it's going to be forgettable. Right. There has to be some journey that the hero, not you, the client is struggling with and that they get your product, your help in some way, shape or form to help them be more successful on the other end. There is, um, there was a, a process. I remember somebody saying, it was one of those, imagine a world where blank and blank and blank mm-hmm. occurs, right? How, how might that look? Um, but, it, but in terms of, of connecting the stories, I was just thinking here on, on a couple of different things that um, I heard a great line. Let me put it this way. He said, the opposite of talking isn't listening. The opposite of talking is waiting to talk. <laughs> People are so eager to tell the story um, that it may not be specifically connected, or if there's something that they get wrong, they don't have at their disposal an alternate version or a different one. How important is it that people have a roster of great stories and do the research on the front end to know the one that's going to be relevant to them? It's like um, an athlete only having one play ready to, you know, whether it's basketball or football, right? You need to have multiple tools in your toolbox. And that's why I was referring to the stories being like a jukebox or a playlist. You need to have multiple stories ready to go because if you don't and you just tell the same story and it doesn't, it's not the right story to make somebody respond to it. They go, well, that doesn't, that's nice for that person, but I don't see myself in that story. So it's, it's not. But how do people recognize that? Because you and I both know of, of speakers, sales professionals and others who have a story that in their mind, this kills. Like, this is my go-to, and it works every time. This story, And they're so enamored with their own story, and they may get a good reaction, but there's rarely a story that's going to work with a healthcare professional or, or company at the same time as a logistics company, as a, as a food and beverage, right? Right. I would say it goes back to, again, how much empathy you have for the person you're talking to. What is their pain point? What keeps them up at night? What is their struggle, their overwhelming feeling? And then go, oh, then therefore, that sounds like the story I have on someone else who had similar feelings or worries or stresses. And so that's probably the best story to tell to make them relate to it. Um, but that does require, the, as we opened up with, the preparation. Absolutely. Uh, just like well, it's athlete. not just preparation in terms of your own ability to tell the story and to make it relevant and use the characters and the voices but also preparation on your client and what their their needs and challenges are. You know, you were talking about the opposite of talk and listening and all that stuff. Um, that's what makes great actors great actors is they're responding in the moment as if they're hearing that line for the first time on camera. Yep. And sometimes that's where spontaneity can happen because they know what their line is going to be next. But if they're completely present there's sometimes magic can happen. And the same thing is true in a conversation or in front of an audience that you're so present with them and you can relate to what just happened. Um, I was giving a talk where the person um, who was introducing the CEO who was going to speak before it was my turn to speak, got a bloody nose and had to be you know, taken off stage and couldn't introduce the CEO. Well, that's an elephant in the room. We have to address right. that. Me not to pretend that that actually happened. Um, is kind of crazy because then it seems very robotic. I only do, so I, you know, I talk about how the importance of resilience, especially in sales, right? How fast we get back up. And I have a tool in the sale is in the tail that people are loving called the five, 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 which you ask yourself when you get the no or something embarrassing happens like your nosebleed, will this matter in five minutes? How about five hours? How about five days from now? And man, most things don't matter five days from now if it's a work-related thing. Right, and- but that's one of the things that's in your toolkit that you can pull out because it fit in the moment. Here's where I think it works out really well is in Q&A. Mm. Some of the best ones, someone asks you a question about something, saying, you know what, so listen, so I was working with a client. Let me give you an example of that. I'm working with a client, right? And you yeah. launch into something that's relevant Yes. to them. I do this on stage, right? Sometimes I have, an hour. I'm doing a keynote or something else. Uh-huh. There are ways of peppering your, your presentation with things that somebody might find relevant to 
ask you to come and work with their organization. Right. Right. And so what I might do in a presentation is, is something along the lines of, so I'm working with a, California, a company out in California. I do some consulting as well. And I was spending a half day with them. And here's what we did. And right, what did I just do? Now, I just told people I do half day things, right? Yeah. And I give an example of something that might be relevant. But here's what they came out of that. The brilliance that was in the room, blah, 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 blah. But at the beginning of that, I just told them. But, but in Q&A, that's where I found it really, somebody has a question about something, you can have a great answer. But if you give them an example of a scenario where that happened, and here's how it was resolved, you're also demonstrating your skills at solving that, a case study of where it actually happened. But as you said, when you have a toolkit, when you have an arsenal of great stories and um, examples, and it's hard for people who are 22 years old, you don't have a lot of life and business experience at this point. There's no shortage of 19, 20 year old motivational speakers or life coaches. I'm like, dude, you haven't even had a life. You know, you yeah. earn the right to, to do that kind of a thing. But um, where have you found that valuable for you as you're working with clients to be able to pull examples. And then maybe that's another great um, alternate terminology is example um, for story. Well, a year ago, I was hired by a recruitment firm and they have to sell companies on hiring them versus competitors. You know, the big ones are like Corn Ferry. And, you sure, know, absolutely. Brands like that. And they have to sell themselves on why they're, they should find your next CEO, CEO, CFO, whatever. And um, during the Q&A after the talk, they said, you know, Corn Ferry is bigger than we are and they have more experience in certain practice areas of finding, you know, the next CEO of an entertainment company or whatever. How should we handle that? And I broke the fourth wall down and reminded them that I had to sell myself to their CEO. And they went, oh, because they don't think about There's that. There's a reason why you're talking to me, because I did this. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not just giving you a good idea that may or may not work. I actually use this to get this. Love it. Up. And they went, oh, I said, you know, he said to me, have you spoken to a lot of other recruiting firms? And at the time I had not. And I said, well, I haven't. I have spoken to a lot of architecture firms who have a very similar business model. The teams are broken up into practice areas. This person knows how to renovate an airport. This person knows how to build a law firm. And you have people that specialize in finding people in different industries. And I said, um, and they have a final three that they go in and pitch against competitors, just like you do. And he goes, oh, yeah, in those situations, we ask if we can go last and because we, we think that'll make us more memorable. And I said, yeah, but you can't control that. No, I said, you can control telling the best story. So even if you're first, and then he got, he goes, oh, we'll be setting the bar. You're hired. Because I referenced another industry so similar. So I said, even if you don't have the exact expertise in one industry, tell an analogy where the, the, they can transfer that expertise from one to the other. So that's how I handled that in the Q&A. And they got a lot of value out of it as well. Love this. Talking to John Livesey, the author of the book, The Sale is in the Tail. Um, if people want to get in touch with you and work with you and learn how to bring this into their organization and perfect their own storytelling, how do they do that? Well, everything's on my website, johnlivesey.com. If you can't remember that or the book title, just Google The Pitch Whisperer and all my content comes up. And I have a free gift for everybody. If you take out your phone and text the word pitch, P-I-T-C-H, to 66866, you get the first chapter of my new book for free. There you go. And that'll be in the show notes as well. Hang on to the other side. We'll talk when we're off air. Big thanks to my guest, John Livesey. Um, I'll tell you, you can pick up a copy of my new book, The Morning Huddle, powerful customer experience conversations to wake you up and shake you up and win more business. All of my books, of course, are available on Amazon. If you're watching the video version of this, they're all strategically located here next to my head on the wall behind me. Um, be sure to click to like this podcast, subscribe and leave comments. That's the most important part. Just leave some comment, even if you thought it was good, that'll help uh, more people know about what it is that we're doing. You can learn more about my keynote speaking and my consulting at davidaverin.com. Big thanks to John Livesey. Um, leave a comment, ring the little bell. You'll get notifications of new podcasts as well. Um, and that's it. I'm David Avern. Be good. This has been the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast with David Avern. Feel free to leave a comment and be sure to hit the thumbs up button 
You can listen to past episodes and be notified of future ones by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. David's popular marketing and customer experience books are available in print, as well as Kindle and audiobook, and published in multiple languages around the world. You can stay connected and learn more at davidaverin.com. Thanks for tuning in.